few weeks ago I uploaded a video about the Quake 3 netcode and this comment triggered some core memories. So that code block on screen is why I remember in Counter Strike lag would cause you to freeze in place and then suddenly teleport to where you are. It felt like I'm having a fever dream. All of a sudden it's 2012 again, I'm rushing B with an AK on dust 2 and out of nowhere I start freezing and rubber banding. Next thing you know, I'm dead and everyone is screaming in Russian. I went from rushing B to just Russian in 5 seconds. But why did you use to rubber band in the first place? To find answers to this and other broke internet related questions, I have gone through the Valve developer community documentation. As always, you can find links to all my sources in the description. And to visualize my findings, I have built this, which for lack of a better name, I'm calling the latency simulator. As you know, I'm not a game developer, so I'm completely aware that this is not a game of the year contender, but it will do the trick just for this video. And I know, it looks like Pokemon Dust 2, except instead of catching Pidgeys, you are catching bullets. If you have a better name for this trash code monstrosity, feel free to use the comment section. Anyways, in this video, we'll start with how multiplayer works when your connection is solid. And then we'll break it on purpose in the latency simulator and see what happens. A quick note before we begin. This is not a code review of the Gold Source engine, the Source engine or Counter-Strike. I will be referencing from documentation across multiple engines. Since Counter-Strike began as a Half-Life mod and Half-Life comes from Quake, the concepts here apply to varying degrees to many other games. And in case I got anything wrong in the video, feel free to correct me in the comments. As you know, I really appreciate your corrections or general comments. Okay, we have to start with a very brief explanation of the client server architecture and then work our way down to the dungeons of packet loss hell. So, we got the clients and we got the server. The client renders your game, captures all your input and communicates it as commands to the server. The server holds the authoritative game state, the true game state, it gathers all the inputs and advances the game state. Now, in the case of Counter-Strike 1.6 for example, the server simulation run at 60 ticks per second. That means you're simulating the entire game world every 16.6 milliseconds. This tick rate depends on the specific game and it can be modified, but as they state in the documentation, they don't recommend changing it for obvious reasons since it can cause the game to run improperly. Now, one of the crucial puzzle pieces to understand why you used to freeze is this. The server didn't send out 60 updates per second to every client. By default, it only sent 20 updates per second. So it created a snapshot of the current game state and sent it out every 50 milliseconds. And here's our first problem. How can we run gameplay at a smooth 60 or even 30 frames per second if we're only getting like 20 server updates per second? If we only render the updates that we get from the server, our game would look something like this. Now you might say, but Tariq, why not just send enough updates to match the frame rate? And that's a good question, but sending enough updates would need a lot more processing power and bandwidth. But now, for the sake of argument, let's assume we have enough processing power and enough bandwidth. This would still not solve the problem of packet loss, which would mean every time you lose packets, you would lose frames. The solution was interpolation. And stay with me now, this will explain exactly why they froze. Okay, so generally speaking, interpolation is just estimating the missing bit between two noun points. If we have two positions with their timestamps, we can blend between them and figure out where the object should be at each frame. Assuming of course the object is moving in a linear fashion. Remember, the server is sending out a snapshot every 50 milliseconds. Now, if we only blended between the current snapshot and the next one, we would still get jitter when a packet goes missing. So they used a small trick. Instead of rendering the current snapshot, they rendered the state of the world from 100 milliseconds in the past. This delay gives you two solid snapshots to blend between at any moment. Now in the Valve Developer Wiki you can find this diagram. 
So you have this little rendering needle sitting at these 100 milliseconds in the back. And wherever that needle is, you have two snapshots lined up ahead of it. If one of them goes missing, you still have another one to work with. So you can blend between these two positions without any problems. Now, if I turn the interpolation toggle on in the latency simulator, you will see how it smoothens out the perception of the enemy player. Even though you're still getting like 20 updates per second or even, I don't know, 5 updates per second. Okay, so interpolation handles the external entities. But what about your own character? As you know, your own character has instant responsiveness. There is no 100 milliseconds lag in the movement. And that is handled by the client-side prediction. I will not go into the details of client-side prediction, since I've covered it in the Quake netcode video. So let me just give you a brief explanation. Client-side prediction is a concept where your character moves instantly without waiting for the server to acknowledge your action. Then, when the server responses with the acknowledgement, the game either continues without you noticing anything, or you can snap back into your last valid position, in case your prediction was wrong. During normal gameplay with no packet loss, you don't feel anything. Your actions just feel smooth with zero lag. Now, these are the two mechanics that make the gameplay feel smooth. But, as they say, everything works until it doesn't. Interpolation, client-side prediction and everything is nice and fine, but if you live in this Bermuda Triangle of Lost Packets, not even Prime Karmic can help you out. No code on earth can optimize away a corrupt government. In this place your basic human rights don't even compile. Okay, so during normal gameplay we have the client and server exchanging updates through packets. As long as the connection is stable, everything works fine. But when we experience packet loss, the game starts lagging, we start seeing people freezing, teleporting or snapping back in the previous position. That's what we call rubber banding. Your dad does need to work at Blizzard for you to know this, right? Now, we have three scenarios. First scenario, the client packets are not arriving at the server side. The second scenario is the server packets are not arriving at the client side. And the third scenario, both sides are not receiving anything. Now, I have added these packet loss sliders in the latency simulator. This lets us crank up the packet loss in both directions. This is just an example demo of packet loss, okay? We're not running a real client and server or actually dropping packets. It's just a visualization that reacts to those parameters. Instead of making animations or drawing diagrams, I wanted to make something I can click around, okay? So let's start with the first scenario. The client is sending commands but the connection is suffering heavy packet loss. Now, since the server isn't receiving any packets, nothing should happen from the player's perspective. Your character should be completely frozen, right? Wrong. Remember client-side prediction. Exactly. The player is moving before getting acknowledgements from the server. We are talking here only about the first person perspective. So even though my packets aren't getting through, my game is already predicting the action. And then when the server packet comes in, we have two options. First option, the action is valid, the game continues like nothing happened, you don't notice anything. And second option, the action is not valid. In that case, we experience what's called rubber banding. Now, depending on the amount of the packet loss, this can be a small lag, it can be a full rubber banding which snaps you back, or if nothing is arriving, you are basically stuttering in place. Okay, that was the first scenario. Now, in the second scenario, the server is losing packets. If we crank up the packet loss, you will see enemies freezing, which makes sense if we don't get updates from enemy positions in our game state, in our reality, they will stop moving. Now, depending on how many packets we are losing, you will see people teleporting, stuttering or freezing in place. If it's only a few packets here and there, you will not really notice anything since interpolation will cover for it. And then we have the third scenario where everything is dropping. At this point, everything is frozen. And usually after a few seconds, you get dropped completely out of the game. Anyone who played Warcraft 3 remembers the 
disconnect counter. I remember this being one of the biggest reasons why I switched from playing Dota 1 to Dota 2, even though I hated the graphics at the beginning. For those who are not familiar, in Warcraft 3 you couldn't reconnect after you got dropped once. In Dota 2 you could reconnect for a few minutes even after rebooting your PC. I started playing Dota in maybe 2006 and the last time I played was probably around 2019 or something. Now before we continue a word from our today's sponsor, Brilliant. If your current brain routine is doom scrolling and hoping the algorithm gives you some dopamine, it's time for an upgrade. Brilliant has interactive courses on math, data analysis and computer science. I use it when my code gaslights me that everything is fine. The lessons are bite-sized, hands-on and actually fun, unlike team building events. You can start from scratch and build up step by step, even if your attention span now lasts about as long as a stand-up that could have been an email. Think of it as gym for neurons, clean reps for the cortex. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash Tariq10x, scan the QR code on screen or click on the link in the description. Brilliant's also given my viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Now back to the video. We have covered now on a top level how the netcode mechanics work and what happens when we suffer from packet loss. Now we're gonna talk about the most important part of this whole story, the takeaway lesson, which is understanding their decisions. Okay, when it comes to packet loss, Valve had two options. Either you freeze the play right where he was last seen and wait for the next update, or you try to guess where that player was going and just keep rendering them moving forward. Now, if you open their latency compensation article, Valve actually lays this out pretty clearly. They mention both options, freezing or extrapolating. And what they ended up doing is a pretty smart balanced combination of both. First, they do some extrapolation, not infinite wild guesswork extrapolation, but a short limited prediction. In gold source, they even exposed a variable for it called x extra p max. It defines how long the client is allowed to keep guessing when data goes missing. The default is set at 1.2, which is enough to smooth over a missing packet or two without completely going off the rails. So what happens in game is this. If a packet is late or gets lost, the client continues drawing that enemy running in the same direction for a short moment. That keeps things looking smooth. Then as soon as a real update shows up, it snaps things back into sync. So instead of a character freezing in place mid fight or warping around unpredictably, you get a softer, more forgiving experience. It's not perfect, but it feels a lot better. And Valve carried this idea into the source engine as well. In source, the client buffers around 100 milliseconds of snapshots for interpolation. But if more than one snapshot is missed, it falls back to extrapolation, which by default is set to 250 milliseconds. So same principle, just a different time frame. Now we need to zoom out for a moment and think about the broader context of the decision that has been made here. You have to understand that in the moment of extrapolation, the engine is making a guess and potentially putting a player in the wrong position. I have no empirical data, but one can assume that this will be a wrong guess a significant amount of time. But now comes the most important lesson of this video. The developers, by doing it this way, they put the user experience in the first place. And that has driven their decision to opt for a short extrapolation instead of a instant freeze. Now, you might be wrong a few times, but you also might be right the majority of the time. And that makes the user experience just more pleasant. Now, this type of decision only works in a specific context, like for example in game development. But it doesn't work in a safety critical system like for example in a airplane safety control unit or a car safety system. In these types of systems, for specific functions, you can't allow yourself to guess values. Now, listen, I'm completely aware that extrapolation is used almost in every system, but as I said, it has to fit the context of the requirement. For example, 
Let's assume we have a car safety system that should stop you from hitting people. The system recognizes a walking person, but then all of a sudden it doesn't receive any more data points. You don't want the system to extrapolate that the person has made it to the other side of the street and then not trigger the brake system. You want the system to brake even if it's a false positive, because the consequences are catastrophic. If you have a wrong guess in Counter-Strike, the worst thing that can happen is the player will be seen in a wrong position for a moment. So yeah, Valve didn't just flip a coin. They picked a strategy that keeps the game more playable and that fits their context. They weren't just building the netcode, they were designing around how people actually experience the game. Okay, now I wanna take the moment and say a big thank you to my Patreons and YouTube members. Your ongoing support has helped me immensely to continuously improve the quality of these videos. If you wanna support the channel, there's a Patreon link in the description or you can become a YouTube member or just leave me a comment. So, that's it for today. If you like the content, hit like and subscribe and see you in the next one. Tariq 10x.